you can see, our speakers are answering the charge. Next, Kay Schlossman from Boston College and Cindy Verba from Harvard. Let me interpolate that it's a privilege to be here at a conference honoring Sandy, where I'm learning a lot in a room with a remarkable concentration of people whose work I've read and sometimes taught, but whom I've never met before. I also want to thank Kathy and Pam for making it happen again when it didn't happen in April and acknowledge what happened at the beginning of the week in the city before we had a, con a cancellation. So I'm going to be talking about what I would only have to characterize as a medium size idea. And the only reason that the three of us decided that we would talk about it is that, in fact, it became Sandy worthy because while Sid Verba, Henry Brady, and I were working on these ideas and had some papers in, in the works, we actually heard Sandy Jenks say offhandedly exactly the same thing that I'm about to say in this room. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lay out a couple of ideas that we've already had reference to today that come out of a very influential book in the study of politics and a democracy, Anthony Downs' Economic Theory of Democracy. Downs predicted first that in a two-party system with votes of equal weight, rational candidates and parties would converge at the point of the median voter. His second prediction is that for typically right-skewed income distributions in which the mean income is higher than the median, those at the median or below can benefit by seeking policies that impose high taxes on the high incomes of the few at the top, the effect of which would be to redistribute income from the rich to the poor. So I'm not going to elaborate. We all know it's hardly news that neither of these predictions has been borne out in the last generation. Downs has some critics who point out that his elegant models fail to take into account many of the realities of American politics. And one of them is that we have various arrangements, such as the Electoral College or the Senate, in which the principle of one person, one vote does not obtain. But Downs' critics never mention still another violation of the principle of one person, one vote. And that is the impact of inequalities among individual citizens in their level of political activity. Americans have lots of ways in which to take part in politics other than voting. And unequal political participation among activists, those who, for example, work in campaigns or give campaign donations of various, very different magnitudes, they are allowed to increase the weight of their votes. In order to contest and keep public office, politicians need to attract the support of the activists who staff and fund their campaigns. Activists who have many distinctive characteristics, including strong but not necessarily centrist political views, and in the case of donors, very deep pockets. Including, including recognition of these particular participatory inequalities in Downs' model helps us to understand why our parties and the, and the candidates that run under their banner do not converge at the median voter and why massive redistribution has yet to take place. Let's start with the question of why those below the median do not tax those at the top. Consider this figure, which puts actual numbers around the model that I showed you a minute ago. As in that model, the mean is well above the median in family income. But the median registered voter is not the median campaign worker or the median campaign donor. And the median campaign donor is, of course, considerably more affluent than the median voter. And when we take into account the varying size of political contributions, the person who contributes the median campaign dollar is much more affluent still. 
While the median citizen might benefit from redistributive policies, these political activists, in particular the donor of the median dollar, would not. Understanding why parties and candidates don't converge at the point of the median voter requires that we take into account the partisans and their opinions. This figure shows citizens and activists from the two parties with respect to their attitudes on both economic and social issues. The pattern's complicated. The median Democrat is somewhat to the left of the median voter on both dimensions, economic and social. The median Republican is considerably to the right of the median voter on both dimensions. However, the respective parties' donors pull them even further away from the median voter. Democratic donors are even more liberal in their attitudes on social issues, and Republican donors are even more conservative on economic issues, thus pulling their respective parties away from the median voter. The final figure uses a relatively crude, unidimensional scale, asking respondents to characterize the extent to which they are liberal or conservative, and shows us activists within both parties, those activists who are so critical uh, to mounting successful electoral efforts, both because they work in campaigns and they fund campaigns, those activists pulled apart over the three decades from 1973 to 2002. Among inactive citizens, the ideology of Democrats was more or less unchanged over the period. For inactive Republicans, there was some drift in a conservative direction. In contrast, among the most active partisans, the Democrats have become somewhat more liberal, and the active Republicans move nearly twice as far in a conservative direction. Thus, over the period, politically participant partisans have moved farther and farther away from the median voter. To summarize, taking into account inequalities in political participation helps us to explain the failure of the Downsian model to answer two questions. Why no convergence in America? Why no confiscation in America? Those who work in or donate to campaigns whose economic position, economic needs, and policy preferences do not reflect those of the median voter are in a position both to have additional influence on the outcome of an election and to send direct me messages to candidates about their preferences. Vote-seeking candidates, therefore, do not <coughs> converge at the median voter. Instead, the requirements of running and funding a campaign force parties and candidates to be responsive to political activists whose circumstances and perspectives have been communicated to them. Political aspirants seeking the support needed to be nominated by their parties and to run an effective campaign will be drawn away from the median voter and will have no incentive to bite the hands that feed them by supporting redistributive policies. 